the reason I called the book Behind is exactly what you just said. There's a whole bunch of us that nobody have heard of. You know, some of us get glorified like the Wrecking Crew and uh, the Funk Brothers, you know, for the Motown stuff. But there's a bunch of us out there that have done the same thing that didn't get a documentary made about us. So, you know, I thought I'd write a book and, uh, you know, I, I had I had an entire band of guys with the same, not the same, but very similar resumes as me called the Hitmen. We, yeah, we were I on wanted, tour. Of, I want to yeah. get to the Hitmen, but let's okay. let's just work backwards and and uh, sure. give give our listeners a picture of. Oh, I'll just shut this door. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know what, hold on. Let me just turn you up a little bit. Your volume's sure. a little low. I want to make sure I hear you. Say something now. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Very good. Okay, gotcha. Right. Let me get back into my assigned chair. <laughs> Look at all your records behind you. Amazing. Um, so let's just let's just work backwards a little bit and give our audience a taste of who you are and some of the people that you've played with and made records for. Okay. Um, let's see. Started off in the 60s with a band called The Critters. Um, I don't know how big The Critters were in Australia. We probably sold a few records, but we had uh, three big hits. Younger Girl, Mr. Dyingly Said, and Don't Let the Rain Fall Down on Me. Certainly remember Don't Let the Rain Fall Down on Me. Oh, man, great. Well, I wrote that one. Did you? <laughs> so that, that's a good one. Um, from there, I did a, a brief stint with The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Uh, I was Arthur's bass player for a tour. That was a very interesting experience. He had, um, that, he had that one hit wonder fire, if my memory serves exactly. correctly. Exactly, and he he exemplified it on stage with his head on fire for most of our shows. Really? Oh, literally. He would he would wear a um, kind of a metal headdress with a lyre shaped thing on the top that they would dip in jelly gas, and he would go off stage. They'd light the thing, and he'd have it on his head, and he'd come out. If you look at if you look him up on Google, you'll see pictures of it, and his head is flaming. You know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it's a crazy to, show. Whatever happened to him? He's around. He's he's in his late seventies now. I don't think he's retired. His website looks like he's still booking dates in, in England. So, you know, the amount of makeup he wears, no one's going to know how old he is. He's just crazy <laughs> Arthur Brown. You know, <laughs> you know the God of hell fire is agents. Amazing. That must have been an incredible time with him. Uh, it was pretty wild. It was, pretty, it was a very, going from the critters, which was kind of easy listening, mellow kind of stuff to that. And I was the guitar player in the critters and I was the bass player in Arthur Brown. So, for me, it, it was a vacation because if you're doing lead guitar, you've got to really stay pretty sharp. Bass for me, when it's just oh, 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 fire, oh, da, 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 you know, it's just two notes. It was easy and fun, so right. I loved it. Right. Right. You know. Where anyway, you after from there, well, after there, I was gainfully unemployed, so I uh, I decided to get a job at a um, guitar store. And my boss had this, this interesting girlfriend, a, a very tall, beautiful lady named Carly Simon. Uh, she was my boss's girlfriend at, at the guitar store. So Carly and I knew each other years before uh, she made a record. At the time, she was living with her sister in uh, New York City, and she was a secretary. So we became friends. We hung out. We'd sometimes do songs together and goof off at the store, you know, when she was waiting for Dan to come in and go out on a date. And eventually she left Dan and I left the store and she called me six months later and said, hey, I got a record deal. You want to come play on my record? And I said, you're kidding? Of course. And, you know, that's the way I've always heard it should be. Anticipation. Eventually you're so vain. Let the river run. 21 years I did with her. Wow. We're still friends to this day. How um, amazing. And, and a wonderful thing is she is now nominated to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, I did. I did read that, and well yeah, deserved, yeah, so, and, and uh, uh, long overdue. And and by association, I end up with being associated with an Oscar, you know, an Academy Award, um, Golden Globe. I don't know how many Grammys, Artist of the Year, uh, you know, all this stuff, and being in the video for "Let the River Run" because I played the lead guitar on that, and being part of the soundtrack that made "Working Girl." So that that was a good job. <laughs> it was a good twenty one years stint. Amazing. Um, I mean, you also did the <coughs> excuse me. You also did the guitar solo on uh, 
on You're So Vain, didn't you? I did indeed. All the guitars on it, the acoustic thing that opens it and, you know, the electric guitars, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, as some, yeah. Of those, as some of those albums behind you, uh, testimony to those days. Yeah, well, there's there's the You're So Vain album there. This one is Hot Cakes. Uh, this one is Coming Around Again. This, oh, well, then going on from there, there's Cat Stevens. I did a, a stint with him. Jim Croce uh, worked on his first big hit. I was his bass player for uh, You Don't Mess Around With Jim. Uh -huh, um, those are some cool. more of the artists that I've worked with. And then oh, just God. odd. Hmm? Just tell me what Jim was like to work with. Oh, just a total sweetheart, but it was kind of bizarre. We went to college together. We went to Villanova here in the States in Philadelphia. And I always knew him as his music working with his wife, Ingrid. And that was very folksy, mellow, sweet kind of thing. She often sang the lead and he just did harmony for her. So that's, that's what I was expecting when I got into the studio. And then he said, okay, you know, after, you know, hi, how you doing? Great to see you again, da 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 we sit down. He says, all right, here's the song we're going to do today. And now it's doom, 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 doom. And I said, hmm, that doesn't sound like Ingrid and Jim. Okay. Then he starts telling me the lyrics. And my favorite description, I used to describe this when we were doing, this show, doing it in our Hitman show. The song was about bad people doing horrible things to even worse people. You know, it was, you don't mess around with Jim. And it was talking about chopping people up and shooting them in the head. And, and really? That was I didn't never knew that. Oh, listen to the lyrics to it. Oh, Amazing. yeah. Oh, gosh. I, I thought I've heard that song a hundred times more and, and never, never yeah. knew that. Wow. Well, okay. Lyrics are a bit like that, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So that's, so, is that one? Sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, I, I was, you know what? Let me shut my email off because it's going to keep binging here and annoying us. Hold on. I'll just take one second here and, and hope I don't shut, don't quit this one, which I, there we go. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So you yeah. worked, um, you you moved to London, you worked with people like Cat Stevens, with Jim Croce, <laughs> as you said, with the uh, with Elton John and Kiki D, with Jimmy Webb, The Doors, Andy Williams, Martha Reeves and Rod Stewart. Wow, that's <laughs> quite a lineup. Um, I was a studio musician in London and Almost all of those people's had, people had their own bands. Rod Stewart, of course, had his own band. But what, what would happen was because Your So Vain was really the thing that, that kicked my career off. That was such a big hit. And because I did the solo on it, I was in demand. But again, Rod had his own band. So when he, what I did with Rod was the initial recordings for his uh, songbook, uh, the, the, you know, the Cole Porter, uh, George Gershwin songs that he did, I think. I don't know, 10 years ago, he released it. I worked on the initial recordings for that because his band, he just was fooling around. It was kind of demo. So he just asked a friend, who should I call in to do guitar? And the friend recommended me. So I, I sat there and played with Rod. Uh, and uh, with Paul McCartney, that was a case that he played on my record. <laughs> Here's how that worked. We were singing um, James Taylor's um, Mocking, not Mockingbird, uh, Night Owl. And Carly had called in Doris Troy, big singer. Uh, she had the first hit of Just One Look back in the 60s. Uh -huh. Then she became a session singer in London. Bonnie Bramlett of Delaney and Bonnie, me and Carly, we were going to do the backup vocals. And we're sitting there doing the vocals and, and Richard Perry, our producer, keeps hitting the talk back and saying, eh, I don't know, guys, it's not happening. Try something else. And then we try something else. Finally, he didn't say anything. We stopped. I go, oh, I wonder if we got it. And I kind of looked around the baffle into the control room and he was talking to somebody. And I'm looking at Carly, I said, I don't know what's going on. And Carly says, Richard, what's happening? Is that okay? Click. Richard tells me you're having a bit of trouble out there. Can I come out and give you a hand? And it was Paul McCartney. He just wandered into the studio because he was doing Live and Let Die in the next studio. <laughs> <laughs> you know that these kind of guys, Paul and, and people up here. So when they're in the studio, they just wander around and you know, because they can walk into anywhere. No one's gonna say, "Hey, this is private. Get out of here." Right. So he walked in, then he came out and sang with us. You know, and, and he gave us vocal parts that immediately worked. I mean, they better. I mean, with his reputation, he's not gonna come up with bad vocal parts. So, so that ended song, up being the final which record. So, which song was that? Night Owl. It's on the uh, the same the No Secrets album. Same one as. Uh, 
uh, your Sylvain. Oh, how incredible. Well, we'll, yeah, so, we'll have a listen to that right now. Um, right, and then, then later on, it just, just the second connection, um, and this is all in the book, and I tell the whole story, but uh, he, um, he, what is the word, debuted Wings at the Hard Rock in London. And now, the Hard Rock in London was the first Hard Rock anywhere ever. And I used to go there just to hang out. And I got an invitation through Richard Perry, Carly's producer, to come and see this, this debut of Paul's new band. Nobody had heard of Wings. I didn't know what they were. So I'm going there and I'm sitting and yeah, it's a good band. I'm listening to it. I'm playing. Now, I was friends with Henry McCullough, his, his guitar player. Henry should have had his little binge after the show, but he, he <laughs> but he, he had, you know, 10 drinks over the line before the show. During the show, during a blues solo, he staggers over to me, and I'm kind of in the first row because I, you know, they just gave me a good seat. He goes, Jimmy, I can't play, man. I'm too drunk here. And he hands me his guitar. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Uh, so I just say, what the hell? It's a blues song. I can play a blues song. So I just grabbed his guitar, kind of wandered up play along now Paul had his back to me so he didn't even know I was there and he didn't really notice anything had happened till the song was over and I finished and and he kind of turns around and goes like and then he recognized me from the Carly session so I was like and I'm pointing to to Henry who's like kind of laying back in my chair next to my girlfriend and I said I, I put the finger I said just give me a second I walked back I said you feeling better man I think I think you better get back up there and I handed him he says yeah he says I'm all right now Matt yeah and he and he climbed up there so that was my second gig with Paul McCartney Incredible. Total, totally out of the blue it's not like you know it's not like I joined his band I just fell in his place by accident <laughs> <laughs> what, what amazing stories. You must have a plethora of stories like that to tell. And I They're guess all in the book. That's, that's what the book is filled with, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, what instigated the book? My son. Actually, I used to visit him, um, you know, every now and then. See, I'm in, I'm in the middle of the, the country. He's on the coast. He works for Atlantic Records in New York. So uh, he's there and he's stuck there. So, I, you know, I go see him from time to time. And as I was saying, I was touring with the Hitmen. So whenever I was in, in the New York area, I'd call him and say, hey, let's go get a beer. So we'd be sitting down talking and he would he stopped me in the middle of one of my conversations and telling him one of this, these stories like I just told you. He says, Dad, you've got to write a book. I said, write a book? Dude, I, I flunked English in college. What are you talking about? And he says, no, I'm telling you, he says, just write down the stuff you're telling me and it'll be great. I said, who is going to want to hear this? He says, my friends will. Now, he's 20, oh, I just turned 30, actually. So that's a that's a very different generation. I'm, you know, from much older. And he says, no, my friends love this stuff. They want to know how it all happened. They want to, I said, really? all right, I'll take a shot at it. So I started writing and I said, well, this is kind of fun. Before I knew it, I had about six chapters done. And before I knew it, I had 400 pages because <laughs> I, I kept good diaries and I kept good calendar. And I would go back to my calendars and I would see the occasion. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. And then just write it out. The gift of Blarney. <laughs> Amazing. And and how was that process for you? It worked OK? It was OK. Um, I really had to go over it and go over it to make it interesting because if you just say i showed up at this studio and i played with this guy snore there's nothing interesting about that so i had to dig into my my, my memory and say what happened with these people that was unusual something that you wouldn't think of something that never would end up in people magazine and i mean you know crazy things like being when when we were in london um carly's manager was the uh, director of Playboy International Entertainment. So we would always hit on her, like, when are we going to meet Hugh Hefner? When are we going to get to go to the Playboy match? And finally, in the middle of those sessions, she says, well, we got a party for you. And I said, what party? And I would have gone to any party because it was London. I didn't live there at the time. We didn't know anybody. So yeah, let's go to a party. Who cares? And she says, uh, Victor Lowndes. I said, who's that? She says, oh, he's the head of Playboy in London. I went, Oh, that Victor Lounge. <laughs> okay. So here I am at a Playboy Bunny party, 23 years old with testosterone coming out of my ears. And 
I don't want to tell the whole story because it, it's really wild. But Andy Newmark, our drummer, just before we left, hey, says, hey, you want to have some fun? I said, sure. What? He said, here. And he shows me this little piece of paper with two little blue dots. on. I said, what the hell is that? And he said, it's acid, man. You want to do it? I'm like, I've never done that before. He says, oh, it'll be cool. Mm -hmm. So I did it. Never again, just this one time, you know, I'm not Timothy Leary. And we went to this party of Playboy Monies and movie execs and all these people on acid. Wow. It was beyond nuts. It was hallucinations. It was like, ah, why did I do this? Yeah, I can't wait to read all about that. Yeah. Um, was... Jimmy Ryan, tell me about the Hitmen. Why did you put them together? I didn't. I was asked to join. Uh, the Hitmen started out as three members of Frankie Valley's Four Seasons. And they, Jersey Boys, the play Jersey Boys, had just really gotten big over here. You know, it was the, the life story of Frankie Valley and Four Seasons. Yep, yep. And these were the three guys that made Oh, What a Night and um, Oh, God, Who Loves You and, and Swearing to God and My Eyes Adored You. And these, these were the guys. It's the only person from the Four Seasons we didn't have in the band was Frankie Valley. So it was the three of them. One of them, Don Saccone, was my roommate from high school and the lead singer from The Critters from way back. Oh, uh, sorry, roommate in college. Yeah. So he called me up and said, hey, you want to be our guitar player? And I said, sure, that sounds like fun. He says, uh, you got to sing the Frankie Valley parts. So I said, what? He said, you can do a falsetto, can't you? I said, yeah, I guess I'll try it. So we did it and we had two other guys uh, joined the band there were six of us and we went out doing all four season songs as the four seasons but we were called the hitmen and we were drawing all kinds of crowds and it was great because everybody was a studio singer we were really and they were all studio musicians too so the harmonies were perfect and they really were the four seasons because jerry polchi our drummer was the guy who sang oh one a night he was the guy who did the record so it was the real deal anyway one by one People started leaving. Jerry met a millionaire and decided that he wasn't didn't need to be touring all over the place. So he left us. Don met another millionaire lady. He left us. Uh, our bass player died. Um, he had cancer. And so we brought a couple of new guys in who are actually better than the guys that left. And that that went really great for five years. But at the end of the at the end of 10 years, COVID came along. Yeah. And all of our gigs just moved way into the future and i finally just said do i really want to be doing this i, I was in an airport every weekend for 10 years yeah you didn't you know, meet a millionaire woman too i did not i met a wonderful woman but she wasn't a millionaire <laughs> hey that's even better <laughs> yeah it really is it really is yeah because oh and, and by the way jerry is now divorced from the wonderful millionaire oh, woman so, so it just I, goes I, to I, show money's not everything it's not no 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 Jimmy Ryan, the book's called Behind, Autobiography of a Musical Shapeshifter. It's uh, available through Amazon and uh, out now and uh, loads of great stories to tell. I bet you've got a whole lot more that weren't even included in this, were, were they? Oh, no, 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 no. It's a, a long list. You know, the Jim Webb stories. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, more it's not a... It's not a huge, it's not a huge book. It's about 280 pages, I think. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I, I made sure to make them fun and funny. Great. You well, I can't, can't wait to give it a read. That's awesome. Jimmy Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. What an absolute pleasure chatting with you. It's just been delightful. Oh, thank you, Sandy. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll stop recording here. I just wanted to finish up in case we were thrown off Zoom, but I did want to say thank you again for for bending with me you don't reckon yeah. carly would do an interview with me would she carly's in a strange place right now um i we email back and forth occasionally not not super often um she had breast cancer and a double mastectomy and that mm. that really threw her for a loop you know getting divorced from james which was a while ago uh threw her for a loop and then her husband after that turned out to be gay and he dumped her um she broke her hip and she told me she she didn't open her computer or leave the house for six months this was about a year ago oh wow uh, probably not i mean i i can i can ask her well maybe we'll I wait her... until she's 
until she's in a in a bit of a better place and and back doing something she's got something really positive to say rather than just looking back over her career yeah i, I, I respect that yeah she's she's now i think 77 or 78 Everyone's that age now. Any, anybody who was any good in the music business was is that age. But I'm I'm really impressed by the fact that your son and his friends are into music and into into exactly. what's come before them because I don't think that that's a um, a common thing at all. I, I love when the young ones are interested in in, in, yeah. in their mentors and their. Uh, and it's not exclusively yeah. either, because they they still love the Billie Eilish's and the, the Ed yeah. Sheeran's and all that. Yeah. But they also love Pink Floyd and the Stones and, yeah. and, and it's people good. like that. So that's yeah. really encouraging. Really yeah. encouraging. That's great. So yeah. he must he must be awfully proud of you for having completed this book. On oh, he is. Suggestion. He is. I gave him credit in the front of the book for and and in the introduction. But I, you know, the whole story I just told you. So he, he loved it. And he told Fabulous. those friends. None, none of them bought the book because they don't buy books. Kids don't read. That That is a very sad thing. They go to podcasts and they go to the movies. Is it, is it out as an audio book too? I've started an audio book. And when I initially started this, my publisher said, wait on the audio book. Let's see how the thing does. And we're still kind of in that state, but I've done about six chapters. I probably will do an audio book. The only thing about the audiobook is there's no money in the audiobook. They're much what about cheaper. about a podcast? podcast there's, long, money, pod there's money in podcasts, and the kids are certainly getting into podcasts. I'm doing a bunch of podcasts, but they're more like this. You know, yeah, no, no, but, but you could do your own, you can host your own podcast with your own stories and bring in all the people that, well, even some of the people that you're talking about to talk to them, to reminisce about. To, about the the incidents that you're talking about, you know, That's you, re very interesting you remember idea. this, you remember that, and how was it when we did when we went and and did the acid that night, and you remember sure. you couldn't play and you brought me up, and and then you could keep pointing it towards the book too, but just do a a little podcast series and and put that up. Andy Newmark would be way into that because uh, you know we we he auditioned with me for Sly and the Family Stone, and he was oh, uh, the acid really? guy. And he, oh, wow. yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, you oh, that's the funniest that stories. That is the funniest story in the book. I, I call it, it's a family affair. Uh, if you read nothing else in the book, read that chapter. It's hilarious. Tell me about it before we get thrown off here. Oh, okay. Um, out of the blue, Sly's drummer contacted Andy and said, hey, I'm quitting. You know, maybe contact Sly, you might be able to get the gig. Now, Andy had not become what he is now, you know, having played with everybody. Uh, so he just said to me, hey, look, let's go over to Sly's house. I want to audition. I said, whoa, what? What are you talking about? And he said, well, he lives in Beverly Hills and, and uh, we're here. We were playing at the Troubadour in Los Angeles and it's 10 minutes away. So we go over there. And it's just, it's like a fun house. It's the weirdest experience. Some monster big guy comes to the door. What do you want? You know, and we say, well, uh, my friend told me uh, Sly was looking for a drummer. Stay here. He goes back, comes back out again. He says, all right, come in. And he says, sit over there. And everybody was hostile, doesn't even begin. It, it was like, this is scary now. And then finally, um, Rose Stone comes out and says, Sly's upstairs, first room on the right. Like, really? And we go upstairs and we walk into this room. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. You're going to read the book. The walls were lined with black fur and Sly was basically out cold, flat on his back on a waterbed with this envelope full of cocaine next to him. And there were three guys in suits sitting around. Nobody's saying anything. We walk in. Uh, we're not on the air. We walk in and Sly looks at, he, he kind of wakes up and says, who the fuck are you? <laughs> We're like, oh my God, these two little white guys in this. So, you know, it goes on and on and on. And, and, and Andy auditions on a set of um, pads, you know, just the, the plastic pads, drum practice kits like that. And when I tell you, he played so well. I mean, the, you, you wanted to record what he played on, and it was just clicks. That's all it was. Sly flipped he got up on his bed and started dancing you a funky motherfucker man what the <laughs> you in the slot you in the family 
Rolling Stone, man, you in. It was just, and he's dancing on his bed and everybody's like going like this because, you know, he's pretty high and he could slip and there were bedposts. And the bed was like, it was like a vat of jello in an earthquake. It was like, (laughs) it's with him dancing. Anyway, uh, there are more details and it's even funnier, but that's that's a story. And he got the gig. (laughs) He he became Sly's drummer, worked with him for a year and a half, made uh, the, I think he he was on Family Affair and a couple of big hits. And uh, that, that led to his big career with Roxy Music and Clapton and all these other people. So. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great stories. 